So okay. you've had a storied career with several hit shows. You've, you've created, you've written and directed so many other shows. How does it feel when you see a reboot of one of your shows you created like Sister, Sister, Do So Well on Netflix? You know, it was, it was a pleasure, um, especially for my family and for my sisters. The, you know, I, I based the show on my twin sisters. So um, they're back east and going through COVID. So they were able to, you know, sort of revisit that whole, uh, I guess, era in their life because it came on so many years ago. But as a creator, of course, um, it was very heartwarming to think that uh, the show is timeless, that the audience, there's a new audience um, for the show. And then, you know, it was a nostalgic show for a lot of people. And some people said, hey, you know, we can watch this now with our children. And especially a lot of uh, women wanted to watch it with their daughters, introduce it. And it's a show about relationships. So the fact that, you know, we were able to make something that people could continue to enjoy was, um, was a real pleasure and for it to be so highly rated on Netflix you know was was more than a surprise it really was I mean it was top three I believe for the first week of all the shows that streamed on Netflix and then it ended up uh, you know uh, garnering um, a nice little plug on you know uh, throughout the uh, sort of different platforms because it, Nielsen rated it as a top 10. So, you know, to get a top 10 Nielsen rating decades after you create something and after, you know, people did a lot of good work was was um, very heartwarming. For yeah, me. and you know, you worked on and created some some shows that highlighted black families, black relationships that were just feel good shows that would make people smile and laugh, which we really need, especially today. Why did you develop these types of shows? You know, uh, I, I'm very eclectic in my create creations, but when it comes to shows like that, I take it from my personal experience. You know, as I said, I, I grew up with twins. So, and then all of my family around twins. And so it was, uh, it was something that spoke to me. It was something that was um, sort of organic and basically in my DNA. And I figured if we had so much fun growing up and there was a lot of laugh, there was a lot of love uh, in the family and creating a show like that would allow me to sort of share that with, you know, with an audience. And it was, uh, you know, I hate to use the phrase uh, no brainer because it's cliche, but because of my experience with twins, it certainly, certainly helped. And Keenan and Kel was, was much the same. That was the, Ke the show Keenan and Kel, which was very successful on Nickelodeon and it's uh, out now as well. It's another uh, hit show that you created based on the relationship and the experiences you had with your childhood best friend. That's right, Tyrone and I, and uh, he uh, and I were always, when we were young teenagers, just figuring out, you know, how can we get a car? How could we find girlfriends? How could we get rich? You know, all of these things that you think about when you're 14 and 15 years old. So, <laughs> and, and then the wacky schemes that would pop into your head at that age, um, you know, was, uh, the catalyst, of, you know, for the for for that show, at least for the energy and the types of stories that would be told. So, and of course, you know, Keenan Thompson and Kel Mitchell. I mean, they were just you know a real talent, just like Tia and Tamara Maori. I mean, they were all just naturals. You know, you pretty much just had to wind them up and turn them all loose, and you know, they would do their thing. And then, you know, they their sort of uh, chemistry was infectious, and so I, I think. You know, I was just lucky to have the right talent to put into a vehicle and then be able to just turn them loose and do their thing. And of course, I, I, you know, I can't take credit for all of this. It, you know, ideas are one thing, but ideas are, are executed, you know, by good writers, by good um, showrunners, directors, producers. But, you know, but, but, you're, so but you're also a really good writer and showrunner, and you're also a really good director. You've done all these things, too. And I think what's interesting about you is that you had one of the most interesting paths to Hollywood. Take me back to your childhood in upstate New York. Wow, upstate New York. So I, I was born in a city uh, called Utica, New York. It's right smack dab in the middle of the state. It's, uh, you know, it's east of Syracuse, north of Albany, and about, you know, 250 miles from the Canadian border. And, uh, you know, that's where I was born. And, you know, we, we started out like a lot of people in America, we had our struggles, but imagine, you know, there were six children, 
uh, in a one bedroom apartment. My mother and my father were, were you know, young, a young husband and wife couple with these children. And, uh, but my, you know, the work ethic that both my parents had was such that. So uh, my mom wanted my father to get us out of the city and into the country because she was born and raised in the country. And my father thought it would be a good idea because he always wanted horses. So imagine, you know, a young couple, 28, 27, something like that, where they, my father got a business started. My mom worked hard not to overspend and they were able to buy a house out in the country. And uh, so at, at age eight, we went, I went from being a city boy with my brothers and sisters to literally being out in the country. And, um, you know, and it was a completely different life. I always missed the city in the beginning because that's what I was used to and having to spend the first night out in the country with no lights and crickets making noises and all kinds of you know owls hooting um it was an experience so you know I sort of had two lives really I was in an all-black neighborhood and went to an all-black school for the first half of my um you know young life and then we were in an all-white town in an all-white school and with a completely different life. So we went from being, you know, kind of ghetto poor to, you know, middle class, if not upper middle class, but with horses, you know, in the backyard. And and uh, so, but we have an extensive family. So I was able to sort of bounce back and forth between two worlds. And it was an absolutely, um, you know, now that I look back on it, a very unique, but very uh, sort of rich background that my parents were able to to give us. Yeah, you just now said something. You said you grew up uh, basically in this all-white town. I imagine you faced some challenges, if not externally, internally with that also. Oh, absolutely. It was, you know, it was a completely different world. It just, it just was um, in the beginning, I have to say. So let me just take you back a bit. The school where I went, you know, from kindergarten and first grade. It was a very old building, a very poor school, you know, no library, no gymnasium. You know, we literally would, our, our gym class would be in the basement and they painted some lines on the floor and they would give you a rubber ball and you'd bounce it on the floor and then go to the end and then throw the ball into the trash basket. And that would be basketball. That's how poor it was. And then when we moved to the uh, new neighborhood, that school was brand new with glass walls and folding doors with a gymnasium with glass backboards and bright and shiny. It was like being on a spaceship for, for me. It was a world I had never seen. And then, of course, the people were curious. Um, you know, people would drive by our house sort of slowly and look at us. And we, we, we moved in the summer. So I remember the first day of school, stepping in the school. And uh, I didn't get two feet into the school before I heard the N-word. And, and that was just from a, a young girl who didn't know any better. And she ultimately became one of my best friends, but, and I, I had um, really good relationships, but the people in the town, once they got used to us, then as my mom said, look, you know, you can catch more flies with honey than you can with vinegar. So just be open and be nice, be yourselves. And my mom was right. It didn't take too many months before we had good friends. And then the neighbors all became very friendly. And my family, my mom especially, still lives in the town. And we've been there, oh, nearly 55 years or something. And my mom's a fixture. And I dare say probably one of the most popular people in the town. And we, we ultimately fit in and we just lived our lives. And we had good friends, good neighbors and extremely good relationships. It was just a little bumpy in the beginning and there were a few standouts, you know, kids who didn't like us, but ultimately it was just about good people living together. And that neighborhood, we didn't even lock our doors. People would, you'd come home and sometimes there'd be a note on your table saying, I borrowed your lawnmower, I'll bring it back. Oh and, you, and you don't even know what neighbor <laughs> borrowed the lawnmower. Wow, <laughs> wow. So here you are in the country when did you first get a love for movies? What, you know, what made you think, I, I'm going to do that one day? Like, how did you know, I'm, I'm going to go to Hollywood one day, I'm going to do this? You know, so uh, that takes me back to the city. And um, I used to love television. We had an old black and white TV, literally with the, you know, the stereotypical, you know, broken rabbit ears and putting aluminum foil on them to make it work. And it just, but I used to like to watch 
certain shows, Superman and The Lone Ranger. I remember that. And um, and Amos and Andy would come on, and I thought that was silly. I always wondered why those why are those black people looking kind of doing silly things. But I still enjoyed television. I didn't even know who made the shows. But when I was seven years old, um, I had not seen a movie yet. At least I don't recall ever having seen a movie. And my grandfather, on my father's side, uh, Clarence Bass uh, Sr., he came one evening and he came uh, to the apartment where we lived in the, in the sort of tenement. And I'll never forget, you could always hear Papa coming up the stairs. We lived on the second floor and you could hear his feet shuffling up these wooden stairs. And he came in one evening and he said uh, he wanted to take, he called me Kimbo. Where's my, where's my, where's Kimbo, my grand boy? I'm gonna take him to the cinema. And I didn't even know what that word meant, cinema. And the thing about my grandfather, I basically did two things with him. We either went to church or we went fishing and he wasn't dressed for fishing and it was night. So I, I was thinking, oh, maybe it's some kind of night church. So I get dressed, my mother gives me my coat, and we go downstairs and we cross the street and we get on a city bus. And I'd never been on a city bus. And I was amazed with the advertisement, you know, on both sides. And my grandfather put, he put um, the coins in the collection box there up front by the driver. And we sat down and we drive out of the neighborhood, we ride out of the neighborhood into sort of the nicer area of the city. And two things sort of stuck out on the way I remember we passed some really sort of large houses, nice houses with lawns. And I never grew up that way. But, and my grandfather said to me, he said, that's where your grandma cleans house for the white folks. I'll never forget him saying that to me. I knew she cleaned house, but I didn't really know what that meant. And, but that's the way he put it, not with any animosity, but that's what he said. And we continue. And I remember looking at that big house rolling by. Then eventually we get to a bus stop, we get out and there's, a movie theater. Now you understand, I didn't know it was a movie theater. I thought it was a big church, some kind of fancy church. And I literally thought at that age that it was the church, um, a very fancy church. And we went inside and there was a candy counter. I'm thinking, this is a church with a candy counter. I <laughs> like this because it drove me crazy to go to church every Sunday. But my grandfather brought me there, get my candy. He said, we're at the cinema. We're going to see a show. Okay. And then we go inside and there's the, you know, the gold lame and then there's the crushed velvet seats and you sit in the center and there's a big curtain and i thought wow this is this is where the, this is where <laughs> where i thought i said this is where the white people go to church <laughs> and i thought that god was behind the curtain and we sat there but you can eat popcorn and drink your soda in this church i like this and then the curtain opened and it was a projection on the screen and it was a movie there were credits and sat there and watched uh, I still remember the film. It was The Miracle of the White Stallions. It was a Disney picture, 1963. Robert Taylor was in it. And uh, and it was a true story that Disney, I think it was one of their first live action feature films. And so I watched the movie. I didn't understand the whole thing. It had to do with World War II and saving the white Lepizaner stallions. But the visuals with the horses jumping and being in Vienna and the uh, the U.S. Army tanks and trying to save these horses. I understood the basics of the story. And that got that experience sitting in dead center in that theater was fairly empty. And the sound and the pictures, it was overwhelming for me. I just thought it was wonderful. When I got home that night, I remember my mom asked me how it was. And I said, I said, Mama, I said, I said, it was the horses were jumping and the soldiers were fighting and they were trying to save everybody. And it was, it was really something, Mama. And then I said to her that, I said, Mom, I said, who makes movies? And she told me there's a place far away called Hollywood and the people there make movies. And I said, well, I think they're the magic people. And when I grow up, I'm going to be one of the magic people. Mm -hmm. And I remember that night um, saying my prayers. And I, one, I, I said my prayers that I normally say, you know, my grandmother taught me, but then when I was done, I remember looking up with one eye open and say, when I grow up, God, I want to make movies. And that was something I wanted to do ever since. Wow. So my grandfather, and here's the interesting thing. My grandfather, who lived to be 103 years old, oh my gosh. he took me to that movie in 1963. <laughs> it's the first time he had seen a movie in years, and he never went to the movies again, even though he lived until 2006. What? He was born in 1903. 
What? And I asked him years ago, you know, back when he was maybe 100, I said, Papa, why did you take me to the movies that night? And he said to me, he said, I don't rightly know. It just occurred to me. Isn't that interesting? Well, it, it changed your life. It, it did. It, it absolutely did. It, and it set that trajectory for you. And so Papa set me on my path by taking me to the cinema that wow. one evening yep, when I wow. was seven. So, um, you know, it's interesting because um, you ended up with a love for the Japanese culture as, as you got older in your teen years and you worked your way eventually uh, to working and living and, and really immersing yourself in the culture uh, of Japan. Um, how did you end up on one of the most watched Japanese primetime shows. You were also one of the first black actors on a primetime Japanese television show. Yeah, that's what they tell me. Uh, <laughs> well, let's, <laughs> let's start with Japan. I um, started karate when I was uh, 15 years old. Uh, introduced to me by my best friend, uh, childhood friend, Tyrone. And uh, I just just loved it. My instructor was from Japan and I took to it like a fish takes to water and just absolutely loved it. It helped me to focus. It helped me to feel good about a lot of things, you know, teenage angst, you know, at 15, you know, what am I going to do about dating? What am I going to do about my, you know, future? How am I ever going to become a movie maker? And I was able to focus and I was able to um, just immerse myself in karate, but the teacher, you know, he was he hadn't been in the States for very long, so he was very Japanese, and I was just so intrigued. So I anything that I could learn about Bushido and martial arts in Japan, I started reading all these books, and I just I thought someday I'm going to go there. And uh, I was in school in Canada. I thought I was going to be a lawyer, actually. I was, went to school in Montreal, and I was always adventurous. I had to go somewhere. I was in Montreal, but... I really wanted to go to film school, and my my poor father, who worked hard to you know give us a a better life, when I said, "Hey, Dad, I'm okay, maybe I'll go to film school," and he said, "Not on my dime." No. <laughs> he said, "You can be a doctor or you can be a lawyer if I'm paying for you to go to school." <laughs> and after you know two years of school, I just I just had this burning desire. I was doing martial arts more than I was studying in college, and I found out about this program called uh, Experiment in International Living, and you could go to Japan on a, you know, sort of a homestay basis and 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 study. So I applied for that, but it wasn't free. So I literally um, left school in Canada, was doing some night schooling back in New York, but I got I literally got a couple of jobs, and I worked constantly to save enough money to go to Japan. And I I, I enrolled in that program. I paid for my tickets and off to Japan I went and I was there for an entire summer um, and I, it was exactly what I thought it would be when I landed. I still remember I went on Japan Airlines and we landed in, in uh, Tokyo in Narita Airport and it was everything I dreamed it would be. So I, you know, after a summer there, all I kept thinking about was going back. So I ended up um, washing dishes and then becoming an ice cream scooper at Gary Ellis Chocolate Factory in San Francisco. I never went back to New York. I got off the plane in San Francisco on the way back, got a job, worked there, then became a flight attendant for two and a half years, quit that job, and then took my little earnings, and I left and went back to Japan, and then I lived there for five years, and I trained with several masters, I, and uh, there I was, and one one day, I met a Jun Takahashi, he's a, an agent, and it just, it, he, he was friends with a, a nice lady who lived next door to my apartment, and he was amazed that, you know, I could communicate in Japanese so effectively. And he asked me, he said, what, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm here teaching, but I said, I'd like to do movies eventually. And he said, give me your number. And a couple of months later, he called me, I have an audition for you. And I auditioned, I got the role. And next thing you know, I was booked from one show to another show to movies, to stage plays and started a, you know, a career in Japan. I wouldn't call myself an actor because I'm not very good at it, but an on-screen sort of person who wow. could 
you know, say the lines and not knock over any of well, the props. Well, here's yeah. the thing. So when you were in Los Angeles, when I was there also with you, I, I talked to June Takahashi, your manager uh, from Japan. We just all happened to be around at the same time. And, and he was bragging about you to me, and he told me what a big, huge Japanese star you were. And I know you'll never say that, so I'm going to say it now. But um, he said that, uh, you know, you actually left a really incredible position in Japan um, to come back to America because you still wanted to continue the dream that you had that you remembered um, when you were when you were a little boy. Can you tell us uh, uh, how that happened, how that transpired from you leaving uh, Japan to America and what happened when you landed in Hollywood? Yeah, um, you know, June's very kind, very generous. Uh, <laughs> a couple of people might recognize me on the subway, but I wouldn't say <laughs> <I'm> a huge star. <laughs> and it was easy to stand out, but um, it was the most watched Japanese show, though. Let's just—it was one of the—it it was the hottest was, show at the time in Japan. So you, everybody popular. knew who you were. Yeah, um, Choto Kamisama. It was popular, and I was fortunate to be a member of that cast. They were great Japanese actors, and I'm sure they tuned in to watch, you know, them, and then they would see this, you know, foreigner tromping around in a Japanese house. <laughs> 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 but I did what I could. Uh, I just. You know things were going well they really were and i had various offers but i had just finished doing a movie with jackie chan uh, called the protector and so i was cast out of japan to go to hong kong to do this action movie with jackie chan danny aiello and of course i got to you know do some of my martial arts not much obviously jackie's the star of the film but um i had a pretty beefy role and it was so exciting to me because i was always a uh, you know, a Bruce Lee fan. And when I got to Hong Kong, I like my dressing room was the dressing room that Bruce Lee had had and Bruce Lee's makeup artist was now doing makeup on me. So I kept asking everything about Bruce Lee. And they said, you do know that this is a Jackie Chan movie, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and Jackie couldn't have been nicer. It was fantastic. So I come back to Japan after a couple of months in Hong Kong doing this film with, with Jackie Chan and i just and it was a film that was being distributed by warner brothers here and i just thought oh i just i wanna wanna go to hollywood my dream and and seeing the director direct the picture james glickenhouse and i just thought that's what i want to do and it just reignited that that desire and i'm thinking i'm here in japan but my family no one sees anything that i'm doing and i just had this burning desire and so right when there were sort of lots of offers starting to come in to do things in Japan, I just decided, you know what, I'm going to Hollywood. And I don't know if the timing was right, probably not, but who knows about timing. I left and I came to Hollywood and knocked around town, getting an agent and, you know, but the, I still have that, that one little issue, which is I'm not a good actor. So I did. So I, you know, I, not doors didn't fly open. I'm spending all of my money and eventually I thought, you know what, maybe I'll just write something that I can be in, even though I never knew how to write, right? And I had, go, go ahead. Yeah, I, well, I, I was going to say, well, I was going to say, I'm glad you're telling, going to this part now because you struggled for, for many years in Hollywood before you actually could make a living, you know, from yeah. your dream, as you told me before. So I was going to ask you, yeah, tell me the, the story of how you wrote your first screenplay. So I, I, I actually, after about a year and a half of um, just trying to schmooze my way into anything you know i ended up being an extra on a couple of things and you know things like that but um then all of a sudden my funds were starting to become depleted as you can imagine i bought a car paying rent i'm going out to dinners trying to meet people with no income and i'm spending you know money that i had made in japan and eventually i thought this is not working and i'm almost out of money so i had to get a I had to get a day job which was a shock to me but i ended up getting a job working for uh, duty-free shoppers at uh, los angeles um, international airport. Well, that's where they do the sales. And fortunately for me, the, 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 the biggest customers for that business for, you know, duty-free exported goods, um, were Japanese people. And so I went in for an interview thinking I could just get a nice little hourly job. And they offered me the job as a manager of an entire department because I could speak Japanese. And so that was fine, except that was sort of a career path. And at one point they asked if I could relocate and run an operation in Dallas, Texas. And I thought, oh man, that's far from Hollywood. So I ended up not doing that. 
and um, leaving my position and thinking, nope, I'm not leaving Hollywood. I'm at least here and let me just figure out how to make all of this work. And so I ended up leaving that job and I, I um, didn't know what to do. I had enough money for six months to, you know, feed myself, but I couldn't pay the rent and feed myself and do some of the other sort of things that I needed to do. So I, I talked to my mom about the situation and my father saying, Hey, you know, I got this offer in Texas, but I, you know, no offense to Texas, but I don't want to go there. I want to be here because at least the dream can stay alive if I'm here. And so my mom said, look, what do you need? And I said, I, my rent's $500 a month. How long do you need it? I said, six months. And so my mom said, she said, you know what? She said, if you stop dreaming, you die. And so you just let me worry about your $500 and you just do what you need to do. And so my mom sent me $500 a month for six months. And during that time I wrote, I went, I went, I said, I'm going to write something that I can be in. And I literally bought a book, um, Sid Field's book on screenplay writing. I think at, at a store called French is on, uh, uh, in West Hollywood, read that one night. The next day I jumped up, I ran over to a nearby Kmart. I bought a stack of legal yellow pads, a box of pencils, and I started writing a screenplay. And it took me about six months. And, uh, and I finished it on a Friday. And now I had a friend who I couldn't even type. I didn't have a computer. And I had a friend I had met in Japan who actually lived out in Malibu in a trailer, taking care of a rich person's property so he could surf all the time. And he typed it up in screenplay format for me. And then I, I got it to an independent producer on a Friday. And then I spent that weekend with not with nothing to eat because I had um, I depleted all my funds and I, I handed in the screenplay and then I, um, I remember on a Saturday morning, I went, it was a B of A, I went to a B of A to get some money out so I could buy something to eat. And I still remember I went to the ATM and I only had $19.67 left in the bank. And when you don't have a minimum of $20 in the bank, you can't withdraw any money because the 20 is the, you know, the lowest amount of money that you could um, uh, you know, take from a bank, from an ATM. And so I spent that weekend with no money and no food uh, because I couldn't get any money out of the bank. My, my, my little $19.67. And Friday, and I spent the weekend thinking, what am I gonna do? Am I gonna have to give up my dream? Am I gonna have to humble myself, maybe ask my father for a plane ticket or even a bus ticket back to New York, upstate New York? And the thought of that was just agonizing to me. And then Monday morning, my phone rings and the producer says, um, read your screenplay over the weekend. I'd like to make a deal on this screenplay and come to my office on Tuesday. So on Tuesday, I went to the office and um, I ended up walking out of there with a check. I negotiated my own deal and ended up walking there out of, with, with a check. And I didn't even go to my bank. I went to their bank, cashed the check, <laughs> and I had all this cash. Oh. <laughs> and then I drove to my bank and deposited it. Yeah. And that's how I started writing. And I, I have never had another job other than writing or directing since that day. What I think is so fascinating is somebody might hear the story and, 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 and think, wow, you just saw the breaks. You got all the big breaks. But the truth is, is no, you actually created your own path. I mean, you had to literally decide for yourself. You were going to read this book, learn how to write a screenplay, do it you know, spend that time to do it. And so you put a lot of hard work into this and you also uh, overcame a ton of obstacles doing this too, because you also decided you weren't gonna take the easy way, which is to take the job in Dallas, which was the big money, which is overseeing this company, right? Um, so I just, the story to me is so fascinating. And what I love is that it's coming full circle now for you because you're working on a huge project, a blockbuster movie called Yasuke about the first black samurai in Japan. And so, you know, I like to say it's kind of a, a mix between um, Black Panther and maybe, uh, what would you say, maybe the uh, another another Last movie. Samurai, Last Black Samurai, Panther, Black, Panther, Black Panther, kind of a com combination of those. Gladiator. Like, Gladiator, mm -hmm. right. And so I, I look at this and I go, wow. And, and it combines all of your favorite things with Japan, martial arts. you got these huge uh, actors, I'm sure, and you've got a huge, huge budget. Um, why are you so passionate about this project? Well... You know, I, I mean, I love all of my stories. And, you know, before I even jump to that, I, I do have a film coming out on April 9th 
nationwide called Tyson's Run. <clears throat> Excuse which I, me. Which I have seen. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> so that's, that's coming out nationwide. So we're thankful for that. And right behind it should be a film called uh, Head Shop, terrific cast. And we're just in post. I should be finished with that actually next week. But I've always had this burning desire to again, work in Japan again, but to tell this, this story that I learned about when I lived in Japan. And it's this true story of an enslaved African boy who grows up to be a man, having been taken around different parts of the world um, as a servant, but also as a warrior. And ultimately, um, a the, it's called the visitor of the east from the catholic church takes him to japan when japan is really trying to convert many japanese to catholicism and he's taken to japan where he um in kyushu learns to speak the language he's there for about a year and a half and then eventually they're invited to the court of the most powerful warlord in the, japan um oda nobunaga and this warlord is so intrigued and so sort of impressed by this black person and they had never seen a black person before so as a matter of fact he makes his um people his servants uh, nobunaga has his servants actually wash him in front of like his whole imperial court in order to or his court in order to prove that he's actually that color he didn't believe it. he thought it was a trick by the church and once he started to speak with this man and understand his capabilities and his understanding of a sort of a larger world where he had been taken you know as an enslaved person he ultimately asked the the uh church to allow well actually he, i guess you don't allow he asked the church to leave yasuke with him he named him yasuke he sort of converted his name and he rises in the ranks and becomes his sort of his closest advisor he went on all of these battles he went to all these battles and fought wars to help consolidate japan that was nobunaga's sort of mission in life was to oh, no, not to consolidate japan into one country not a fractured company what country with all of these different fiefdoms and so you have this this real life character who was a warrior who was had been an enslaved person who actually becomes free by being in service to the most powerful man in all of Japan and probably in Japanese history. And the story was so fascinating to me that it's always been in my head in a story. I said, this is the greatest story never told. And it, it literally is the last samurai and gladiator and Braveheart and Black Panther all rolled into one. And so I've been developing it for a while now. And, you know, we're getting, we're getting closer where we have some actors who want to be in it. We have, you know, bank ready to finance of course COVID is sort of you know made things a little more challenging than I would like but we're not there yet but we're going to get there I am absolutely determined to bring this story to the big screen and in a way I feel even if it's just one iota that I walked a step or two you know in his shoes when I first went to Japan to study my martial arts to be out in the countryside you know to be gawked at you know I was so far out in the country no one had ever seen um a black person either and i remember um when i was in you know very rural part ishikawa prefecture in japan people were very nice to me but people would literally come by the house where i was staying and i asked my homestay sister why do they keep coming and she looked in a in an english dictionary and she said they come to gawk at you <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh what <laughs> and i said why she said she said they have never seen a black person before, wow. only on television. Wow. Oh, so they, they would come and look at me and take photographs. And um, you can only imagine I had homestay grandparents and I actually did some work in the rice fields, but I found that I was working and everyone else was just staring at me. But, <laughs> but oh it was uh, it was just interesting. It was such a wonderful time. But uh, you asked me about the story. That, that story is something that I, I am bound and determined, bound and determined to get told. It needs to be on a big screen, and um, I'm working with some people, some a great team in Japan, including uh, Jun Takahashi and uh, Miwako, and my very good friend Gary. And um, oh, I have no doubt. I have no doubt that's going to be amazing. We're all working hard, and with yeah. you know people here in the states, and we determined to get it made. And I, I think you know not not too long from now. 
people will be able to see a film called yeah. Yasuke. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, very quick, I have a couple more questions for you, just very quickly, um, because uh, speaking of dreams, we know you're living a dream, but as a little boy, this is not necessarily what you had dreams of doing. You wanted to be an astronaut, but a teacher crushed that dream for you. Tell me real quickly what happened with that. Yeah, so uh, as I was saying, you know, I went to a very poor school, inner city school, and it had no library, among other things. It had bats, too, that would fly in out of the vents, but that's another story. <laughs> but, so one day, we were all sort of put in a line, and we were, you know, marched to uh, the public library, you know, blocks from the school, and that was my first time going to a public library. And the, our assignment was to choose a book that would relate to what you wanted to be when you grew up. And so I got a book about being an astronaut. I always wanted to go into space and I thought that would be an adventure. And I knew I had to be a, a pi become a pilot first and then you have to, back then anyway, be a pilot. And then from being a pilot, you could maybe be an astronaut. And so I proudly took that book and I walked over to the teacher and showed her the book that I wanted to check out. And the teacher looked at me and looked at the book and she said, oh no, you have to put that book back. She said, little colored boys can't grow up to be astronauts. And uh, I had to go and put the book back on the shelf. She told me you could be a plumber or something like that, but not an astronaut. And so um, that was, uh, that was, that, went, that left a mark, I have to say. It, it left a mark. And um, and what happened as a result was when you started making money, you did yeah, something. I, I, you decided I'm to a, do something. Yeah, I, I just remember being in a barbershop and, and seeing that uh, it was either Jet Magazine or an Ebony Magazine that James Brown had his own airplane. And I thought, if James Brown can have his own airplane, I can have my own, my own airplane. And so, you know, after we met with some success with Sister Sister and some other scripts I'd written and TV shows I created um, as a gift to myself. I, uh, when I turned 40, I um, went to a flight school to take my first flying lesson. And I flew, I think, two times. I had about three, three and a half hours of training. And then I bought myself an air. I, I know That's that sounds right. arrogant, but I bought yeah. myself an airplane. And I had my instructor teach me how to fly my own airplane. And then I actually took some time off from work and I just became obsessed with flying and I went all the way. I, I actually got I'm a commercial rated jet pilot yeah. and I went all the way and flew. I ended up buying two airplanes and flying those. And then I went to jet school and- You're and like, I'm, I'm an astronaut, I'm, I'm better than that. I'm, I'm an I'm astronaut and I'm one of the biggest movie directors ever, so. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that, but I was, a, I was a mediocre pilot, but here's the thing, you know, one, I got, you get into jets and you can go to 41, 42, 43,000 feet. So you're getting close to going to space. That's how I felt about it. But, you know, being up that high in a jet aircraft and being able to control it and fly it, yeah. you know, I'd get up there and I'd think about, I had to put that book back, but, um, yeah. you know, I guess it just left the burning desire in me. So, gosh, and so it's so important too the, the words that are spoken over children. So it's, a, it's, it's great that you literally made a way for yourself, just like your, your grandpa's, your mother and father, uh, you're doing a movie about the samurai, this warrior, and in many great ways, your, your own grandfather, your grand, your grandpa's and your great grandfather were warriors in their own time. Um, tell me very quickly the story about your grandpa who became the, uh, one of the first black mayors in New York State. Well, yeah, you, you're right. Both my grandfathers, the one who took me to the movies, who was a sharecropper, picked cotton and tobacco and moved his family up north and got me started in the film business. And then, you know, I give credit to my great, great grandfather, Tolliver Holmes, who was an enslaved man in Virginia, who in 1863 escaped, made his way north into New York State and rather than go across the border to Canada, joined the Union Army, bravely so, and then went back south to fight to free other enslaved persons. And he survived the war, then returned to upstate New York, where he then um, worked, um, some land worked as a farmer, odd jobs, whatever he could. And then, you know, he begat his son. Um, and then of course my grandfather, who begat my mother and in the same area. And imagine this, that the grandson of this former enslaved person became the mayor, the first 
well, the, the one of the first African American men to become a mayor of any city or town in New York State, and that's his grandson. And the thing about it is, he became the mayor in a town where he and his family were the only black people. Back in 1974, my grandfather was elected mayor of a town called Bridgewater, New York, Everett Homes, and. Um, and it was a, that, that odd thing about his story is he was so well liked in the town that he was not running for mayor. There was only an unopposed mayor who had been mayor for the previous administration. He was running. And then for some reason, the people in the town decided when they went into the voting booth to write my grandfather's name in as their top choice. And he got something like 70% of the vote as a write in candidate and became. Um, the mayor of of the town, and it's just an amazing an amazing story. He got a letter from he. My grandfather was a Republican, and he got a letter from President Nixon just before he resigned, congratulating him on his victory. And um, and a little sort of side note to the story: my grandfather did not want to be mayor. He did his term, and then he told the people in the town, "Okay, I'm I'm busy. I I'm helping out the town, but I got to get back to my carpentry work. Please don't vote for me next time." So they did not. And the press, when my grandfather became mayor, what they put in the press, it was in Playboy magazine, it was in the New York Times, it was on Paul Harvey News, that a write-in candidate had defeated an incumbent without even running but, and getting most of the vote. And they never mentioned his color. When he decided not to run to be mayor next time, what was in the news was first black mayor ousted after one term. And it was, they put a negative spin on it. And that really hurt my grandfather. And so after uh, the, the new mayor's term was finished, my grandfather then told the people in town he was going to run for mayor. And he pretty much got all the votes. And so he entered his uh, second term. And he was mayor until um, he passed away. He became mayor and he stayed the mayor until he passed away. Yeah, and you sent me a picture of the, there's like a, a whole plaque and a whole thing in the town where you, when you enter the town. A historical, la yeah, landmark, a historic yeah. landmark, and his house is considered a historic landmark there. That is mm -hmm. fascinating story. You have, gosh, you have so many stories. I mean, I don't, I'm like, I, you could do like a whole month of uh, Kim Bass here, you know, and uh, I, I, I love how we can share these stories. I just, the last story I want you to tell though is um, very quickly when you went to, the barber shop as a little boy and you would see an ebony magazine or you would see one of the one of the magazines there and then you went back to the same barber shop years later and you were in the magazine yeah that was i i, I grew up getting my hair cut at a place called griffin's barber shop in utica and brother freeman used to cut my hair and as a young boy and you know even as a uh, young teenager and when you sit in the barbershop, people are talking, but they always had a rack of magazines. They always had, of course, you know, in the black community, the Ebony magazine and the Jet magazine. And I would thumb through those. That's where I saw James Brown got a, had an airplane. I could get one. And I would just see all these people you know, doing movies, you know, Muhammad Ali and all these um, sort of black icons would be in these magazines. And when I was in Japan doing the TV shows and the movies, I'd get a call one day and, um, through June and Ebony Magazine wants to interview me and they had a photographer in Japan and they chronicled me and they ended up doing probably a five or six page spread about this um, African-American man who was, you know, on a hit television show in Japan. Well, my visit, one of my rare visits home to see my family in upstate New York, I come back and I uh, go back to the barbershop to get a trim and the ebony magazine comes out and when i return home that the that the month that issue came out is when i came home and so i was able to literally be in a bar the barbershop i grew up in and open an ebony magazine and see myself in the magazine and that was the strangest experience um uh for that to have happened it was surreal, surreal. Yeah. it was surreal yes and um, very quickly what do you hope your legacy will be you know, that's a tough question. I wouldn't tie my legacy to what I'm doing. I would want my legacy to be about how I live. So for me, 
you know, I want, I would like people to, who know me once I'm gone to think he, when he was here, he learned, he listened, he loved and did more good than harm. And, you know, if, if the people who know me and the people who love me feel that way about me, I, I think that maybe I walked a path that didn't do too much damage to the earth and to the people who, who mean so much to me. And as far as the, you know, movies and shows that I have done and what I intend to do, you know, if people take something, even if one person, you know, I watched something and it changed my life. If one person gets, you know, a smile put on their face or feels something deeply from just one scene or one line that I've written, if it's just one person, then I think I, I did okay. Uh, you know, I, I would think I have done okay. And of course, you know, I hope my son is proud of me, at least for being a dad to him. That's pretty much it. Maybe other people have loftier designs on their legacy, but mine's pretty simple. It's a good legacy to me. Kim, always great to talk to you. Thank you so much, my friend. Uh, we certainly appreciate it. Yeah, the appreciation is all on my side. Thank you so much, so all very right. much. God bless you, my friend. Thank you. Man.